Welcome to the Copper Spice YouTube channel and thanks for joining us. In this video, we are going to explain what it takes to render graphics using OpenGL or Vulkan. Rendering 3D Graphics When we talk about a graphics API, it is important to distinguish between the API specification and the actual library. There are usually multiple layers below the API and the decision of which physical library and graphics driver to call is not defined by the user of the graphics API. The path to the physical graphics card is based on the platform, drivers, and who implemented the API. Understanding the abstraction and how an image is rendered is a prerequisite for writing applications which display 3D graphics. We are going to show some examples of what is required to render a graphics element. This will help to demonstrate why the Vulkan API is more flexible, configurable, and extremely complicated. When someone refers to OpenGL or Vulkan, they are referring to a specific graphics API. There is a piece of software called the Graphics Driver, which implements the interface between the CPU and the GPU. Normally, drivers are written by the graphics hardware vendor. It is also possible for a third-party vendor with enough detailed information about the hardware to write and distribute a graphics driver. This typically happens when the vendor does not provide drivers for a particular platform, or the quality of the vendor-supplied driver is not sufficient. Consider a software application which is using the OpenGL API to render graphics. The expectation is that the developer can be on any operating system using any graphics hardware and everything will still work. This is true as long as the graphics driver meets the specifications of the OpenGL API. It is the responsibility of the graphics driver designer to provide a uniform API independent of the underlying graphics hardware and operating system. This is an overview of what occurs internally when a video game uses the OpenGL API to render graphics to the screen. The source code in the game calls functions which are part of the OpenGL interface. The OpenGL implementation selects a specific graphics driver based on the available hardware. The driver then generates low-level commands which are transmitted to the GPU. After these commands are executed on the GPU, the results are placed in a frame buffer in video memory. The graphics card then transmits the contents of the frame buffer to the monitor, and the image appears on the screen. This process is called hardware accelerated rendering. It's important to note that the only part of this process which occurs on the CPU is a few function calls which generate the commands sent to the GPU. We mentioned the frame buffer, which is common to both OpenGL and Vulkan. This is where the GPU places the rendered image. The equivalent term in Direct3D is called a render target, whereas Metal calls it the graphics render target. For the purpose of this discussion, we will use terminology as defined by OpenGL and Vulkan. When setting up a frame buffer, you may encounter terms like single buffered or double buffered. Double buffered is simply maintaining two buffers so one can be displayed while the other is being rendered. This prevents seeing a partially rendered image and is almost always desirable. For greater performance, some applications use three or more buffers, but this is less common. No matter what platform or operating system your application is running on, a GUI application must have a drawing area where push buttons, text controls, and other widgets are displayed. This drawing area has various names, but it is commonly referred to as a dialog window. A GUI application is typically laid out so multiple dialog windows can be displayed simultaneously on the main application window. For graphics rendered on a GPU, the drawing area of the frame buffer is displayed in a region we have termed a graphics control. 
The intent of the graphics control is to serve as a black box telling the GPU where the rendered output should appear. The frame buffer, which contains the rendered graphics, can only be displayed in the graphics control. There are libraries like GLUT and SDL, which can be used to set up a graphics control to display 3D graphics. This is useful for games and applications where the entire user interface is rendered using 3D graphics. This approach does not scale for a GUI application, which will have both graphics and traditional controls for user input and data display. So what does it take to use OpenGL to render a basic image? These are the steps required to configure an OpenGL context for rendering. Since the fixed pipeline rendering was deprecated and removed several years ago, we are only going to show the programmable pipeline. Using the programmable pipeline requires more work for a developer, since you must provide your own shaders. The trade-off is that you have more control over the output, which results in better images. There is also the potential for an increase in performance with the programmable pipeline, since the GPU is only executing the instructions you specify. In order to call any OpenGL API function, you must first allocate a context using platform-specific functions. For Windows, this is a call to WGL create context, and for X11, this is a call to GLX create context. The next step is to load and compile the set of shaders your application will be using. Then you call two other OpenGL functions to attach the shaders to the context you created in step one. The purpose of these OpenGL calls is to configure the graphics driver. At this point, no rendering commands have been sent to the GPU. Once the shaders have been installed, we are ready to send commands to the GPU and draw images. The commands shown for the first two stages are the main OpenGL calls used for rendering. There are several other calls which may be relevant or required in each stage, depending upon how complex the rendered image is. For example, if you are using textures, these must be loaded by other OpenGL calls before calling GL Draw Arrays, which does the rendering. The GL Bind Buffer call is used to pass an array of data to the GPU. The GL Vertex Attrib Pointer function is used to specify how the data in the buffers are supposed to be used. In other words, this second call establishes whether a given buffer of vertex data contains information about colors, coordinates, textures, or some other property. Depending upon the complexity of the object, you may need to call GL vertex attrib pointer multiple times in order to set up different attributes for each vertex. When you call GL draw arrays, all of the arrays you have specified and all of the shaders you currently have loaded will be used to render an object. Just as with setting up an OpenGL context, displaying the frame buffer also requires platform-specific calls. If your context is not configured to use double buffering, the call to swap buffers is not used. In this case, as soon as you call GL draw arrays, the output image will start to appear and a partially rendered image will be shown. This is why it is usually better to use double buffering so only fully rendered images are displayed. These are the equivalent steps which are required to configure a Vulkan context for rendering. The initial setup for Vulkan has more steps than OpenGL and is definitely more complicated. The ones shown here are the fundamental functions. However, other calls may be required for your particular application. Vulkan provides more intricate control over the way commands are processed. For example, additional configuration is required to select which GPU will eventually execute your commands. One of the other steps required during configuration is 
is to set up the synchronization between the CPU and the GPU. With OpenGL, synchronization is handled in the graphics driver. In Vulkan, the application developer is responsible for setting this up, so the GPU does not start processing your commands until the data has been transferred to graphics memory. In return for the user dealing with this complexity versus having it built into the graphics driver, your application can achieve better performance with Vulkan because the GPU is more likely to be working concurrently with the CPU. Once Vulkan has been configured, an application can transmit commands to the GPU to render objects. With OpenGL, there are a minimum of two calls to set up the data buffers. In Vulkan, it takes at least four calls, and usually several more will be used to achieve maximum performance. Although there are more function calls in the rendering process for Vulkan, it turns out these calls are less work for the CPU, which results in better performance. A shader is a sequence of instructions which will affect various aspects of an image. There are four main types of shaders. Almost all graphics hardware supports the vertex shader and fragment shaders. Cards designed after 2008 usually add support for tessellation and geometry shaders. The shaders are processed in the order we have shown. The vertex shader transforms the 3D position of a vertex to a 2D position on the screen. This shader also is usually used to calculate values used by other shaders. This shader executes once for every vertex of an object. Every object, which is the 3D shape we want to render, is composed of either triangles or squares. The typical primitive chosen is the triangle. The more triangles that are used to represent an object, the more times this shader will be called, and the more detail or realistic look the shape will have. The tessellation shader allows refining a very coarse model into a finer, smoother model. The geometry shader is usually used to define new geometry, such as projecting shadows from one object onto another. Both of these shaders are optional, and many applications do not have any reason to use them. Finally, the fragment shader is run once for every pixel or part of a pixel that a given triangle occupies. This shader is responsible for applying textures and usually lighting. The Direct3D API refers to fragment shaders as pixel shaders, although this is misleading since a fragment at the edge of a triangle may only occupy part of a pixel. For game developers, or anyone doing high-end 3D graphics, the shiny new object is the field of ray tracing. This is not a new technique, since ray tracing has been the gold standard for high-quality photorealistic rendering for a long time. This rendering capability was only recently added to OpenGL, Vulkan, and Direct3D during 2018. Ray tracing requires a great deal more computation than the rendering methods we have been describing so far. The GPU needs more information about the material properties of each object, and has to do more work to produce each visible pixel. Instead of simply calculating which pixels a triangle occupies on the screen, the ray tracing technique bounces virtual beams of light off the surface for each pixel. Each time the beam hits another surface, it may be further reflected or refracted. The ray tracer also has to send shadow rays toward each light source in the scene to calculate illumination. If there are reflective or transparent surfaces in the scene, it may require following hundreds or thousands of rays to compute the color of one single pixel. Until recently, the idea of rendering using ray tracing in a video game on consumer hardware was absurd. However, NVIDIA recently released several video cards which are now capable of real-time ray tracing. 
While the performance is currently much slower when ray tracing is enabled, the displayed image is substantially more realistic. What remains to be seen is whether gamers care about the increased realism, and if the hardware improves rapidly enough to make ray tracing worthwhile to the consumer. Choosing which graphics API to use in your application is rarely simple. Sorry to say, there is no right answer unless you know the exact hardware and operating system your application will run on, and there is no chance this will ever change. If your usage is Windows only, then Direct3D is potentially your best choice, unless there are features in Vulkan you might need someday. If performance and cutting-edge GPU features are not vital, then OpenGL ES version 2 or 3 will give you access to the widest range of platforms and graphics hardware. Even on platforms where OpenGL ES may no longer be supported, linking with a third-party library like Angle or Glove will allow you to continue to use OpenGL ES. For an application which is sensitive to performance, we suggest basing your graphics rendering on the Vulkan API, since it is more modern and extremely flexible. This option gives you native support on current versions of Windows, Linux, and Android. Using the Molten VK library allows your application to target all current Apple platforms by translating the Vulkan API calls to Metal. The current direction and design for our new Paint library will target Vulkan. We may elect to add support for OpenGL if we find the availability of Vulkan drivers are too limited on older operating systems or graphics cards. Our Paint library will have a C++17 interface, so any C++ developer can link with it and utilize this library. Users of the Copper Spice GUI libraries will also benefit as we use this new paint engine to provide native rendering. As we get closer to releasing this library, we will provide more details and share what we have learned. For more information about the Copper Spice libraries, please visit our website at www.copperspice.com. Thanks for watching. We hope you found the content of value. If you have any questions or feedback, please feel free to leave a comment on this video or send us an email. Please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and come back in a few weeks for our next video.